Is the Earth a globe whirling through space? The Importance of a True Cosmogony by Carl Smith It is hardly necessary for me to remark that the popular belief is that we are living on a whirling globe of land and water. Whether this be or be not a correct and demonstrable theory, I intend here calmly to discuss. Its popularity is no argument for the accuracy of the theory, and though it is taught by men who in some cases have made astronomy a life study, it would be unsafe to accept for truth any theory, even though it come from such men, unless such theory could be or was confirmed by the facts of nature. Great men have made mistakes. Now the question arises, are the theories of modern astronomical science confirmed by facts? Unfortunately, or fortunately, as I shall show later, they are not. A careful examination of any astronomical work by a mind-seeking truth will reveal this undeniable fact that the doctrines of modern astronomical and cosmological science are based entirely upon hypotheses. As such, those doctrines can only be regarded as the speculations of certain individuals and therefore possibly valueless so far as a correct explanation of phenomena is concerned. If then we desire to obtain reliable and logical explanations of known data and to ascertain the true form of the earth upon which we live, it will be necessary to adopt the zetetic method of investigating, starting from known facts. This method we as zetetics adopt because it allows of no speculations or premature deductions, and as the conclusions arrived at by this process are the result of experiments and a careful examination of facts, they are bound to be more accurate and trustworthy. The term zetetic is derived from the Greek verb zeteo, which means to search, to trace out, or to examine. This term we use in contradistinction to the word theoretic, which means imaginary, speculative, supposing, but not proving. It is needless to say which method is the easier of the two, it being much easier to suppose than to prove, to speculate rather than to trace out or search for truth. But we must acknowledge that the conclusions which result from the zetetic process of reasoning, whatever be the subject under discussion, are the only logical conclusions which can be obtained. By adopting this method, we keep on solid ground. We take nothing for granted without a proved basis of fact, and so, as we proceed step by step in the exposition of any phenomenon, we are certain of eventually arriving at a correct explanation of it. As for the theoretic process, adopted by modern astronomers, of basing arguments upon mere hypothesis, until this practice is abolished, we can place no reliance upon their conclusions, but must regard them merely as the fancies of men with vivid imaginations fancies which would lead us into and leave us with a very nebulous idea of the great cosmos around us. I am sure that there are many who, realizing the importance of this subject, desire to obtain a clear and a definite conception of the shape, position, and condition of the world, and to such I repeat the warning words of the Apostle Paul, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Let us beware of being deceived by the unreasonable theories foisted upon us in the name of science. Let us not ignore this undeniable fact that conclusions which result from calculations based merely upon hypotheses are absolutely worthless, even though they came from the pen of an FRAS or from a learned entitled Sir. Let us be candid enough to examine these modern orthodox astronomical theories with an honest and unbiased mind, and if, after a careful and critical examination, we find them wanting and unreliable, let us have the courage to accept an unorthodox, but a more scientific explanation of the terrestrial and celestial phenomena which is offered by Zetetics. It is a pleasure to see a man who is not afraid of going against the current of popular ideas when he has found those ideas to be unfounded and false. The prevailing modern cosmology, in many respects, is different from that taught by astronomers some centuries ago, and different even from that of the last two centuries, but it is one of the privileges of these fellows that they may alter their theories ad libitum, as often as such procedure is considered advisable, and this without confessing their previous mistakes. In the following brief and interesting quotations, we are able to see how this science has advanced, though if I may be permitted to use an Irishism, I am convinced that it has advanced backwards, for while its underlying theories were originally put forth merely as theories, they are now, in this enlightened 20th century, accepted as facts. 
Science means knowledge. It is what we know, not merely what we think or assume, whereas much of the teaching commonly called science is merely assumption. Pythagoras of Samos, a heathen philosopher who lived, it is thought, about 500 years BC, is the first who taught that the sun is the stationary center of the universe, and that the earth revolved around it as one of its satellites, but his opinion did not make much headway. In the second century AD, Claudius Ptolemy of Alexandria, a man reported among the Greeks to be of great learning and wisdom, restored the ancient cosmogony that the earth is in the center of the universe and is immovable, and that the sun, moon, and stars revolve around it as instruments to give it light. This system prevailed until the time of the monk Nicholas Copernicus, who was born at Thorn in Prussia in the year 1472. He studied philosophy and medicine at Sivakova, and afterwards became professor of mathematics at Rome. After some years he returned to his native country and began to investigate the various systems of astronomy. He preferred that of Pythagoras, and after more than twenty years' study his scheme of the universe was given at his death to the world by a friend. He died in 1543, but his system was followed by Galileo and other able men, and the introduction of the telescope greatly helped on the cause. But Galileo was condemned and sorely punished for his theories by the Romish College of Cardinals in 1616. Sir Isaac Newton was born in 1642. When only 27 years of age, he was chosen Professor of Mathematics in the University of Cambridge, and in 1687 he published his Principia, confirming and improving the system of Copernicus, somewhat after the manner in which the cook in a boarding school dishes up what the boys call a resurrection pie, the chief ingredients being the same as it was previously, but with some spice called gravitation, scientifically added to suit the more fastidious palates of the day. Pythagoras, Copernicus, and Sir Isaac Newton all considered the sun to be stationary, and in that idea, for many years, other astronomers followed suit. But... A change came over the spirit of the dream when Sir William Herschel discovered that the sun does move, not indeed around the world, but as he supposed, towards an infinitely distant star in the constellation Hercules. Pythagoras, it is said, first made himself known in Greece at the Olympic Games, and though he distinguished himself by his discoveries in astronomy, etc., he was one of the first who supported the doctrine of metempsychosis, or the transmigration of souls into different bodies. If Pythagoras had actually spent a previous life in Mars or the Moon, it might account for his astronomical inclination. His ability was marked as a Grecian wrestler, perhaps as much as a Greek philosopher. We come to Copernicus, from whom the modern system of astronomy derived its name, he was no doubt a clever man in many things, amongst which we are bound to place his ability to frame hypotheses respecting the shape and condition of the cosmos. Unfortunately for him, his hypotheses were not only confuted at the time of their promulgation, but have been signally refuted by practical experiments since his day, and we now find even astronomers making apologies for much of his teaching. For instance, quote, The Copernican system is that which represents the sun to be at rest in the center of the universe the earth and planets to move round it as a center. Many who reverence the name of Copernicus in connection with this system would be surprised to find how much error, unsound reasoning, and happy conjectures combined to secure for him in all times the association of the system with his name, Chambers Encyclopedia. The work De Revolutionibus Orbium, by which Copernicus made his name, was published just before his death, and in it we find an anonymous preface either by himself or by one of his friends, who assisted in the publication of the work. But there it is. It contains the following confession to the effect that, quote, It is not necessary that hypotheses should be true or even probable. It is sufficient that they lead to results of calculation which agree with calculation. Neither let anyone, so far as hypotheses are concerned, expect anything certain from astronomy, since that science can afford nothing of the kind lest, in case he should adopt for truth things feigned for another purpose, he should leave the science more foolish than he came. The hypothesis of terrestrial motion was nothing but a hypothesis, valuable only so far as it explained phenomena, and not considered with reference to absolute truth or falsehood. This famous astronomer believed the sun to be the center of the universe, and stationary. He did not offer any proof in support of his theory. 
such was quite out of the question. Perhaps his professor's chair, or his gown, obviated that necessity. Now we find the tables have turned, but on just the same kind of hypothetical hinges, for he, Herschel, was led to conclude that the solar system, as a whole, was moving, towards a point in the celestial sphere not far from the star Lambda Hercules. How strangely eminent professors of an exact science contradict each other, nor on this point alone, for even those astronomers who believe that the solar system as a whole is moving somewhere are not agreed as to where it is going. For, I copy from the same work Terra Firma by the late D.W. Scott, a skillful and careful German astronomer named Mudler put forth in 1846 an idea that there exists some central point in the universe around which the sun, with its bevy of planets and comets, revolves in the course of millions of years, and he suggested that the center is situated in the direction of Alcyon, one of the Pleiades. Now if the whole universe be gyrating in this fashion, it needs no philosopher to tell us that it cannot be going in two different directions at the same time. However, these discrepancies, not very small either, we leave for men of science to settle amongst themselves. Though the name of Galileo is an important link in the chain of great men of astronomical fame, we hear little about this astronomer, except that he is called a martyr of science. This, no doubt, is because he was brought before the Inquisition, charged with teaching and publishing astronomical doctrines contrary to the Bible, not sanctioned by the Church, and therefore considered to be heretical. Such doctrines as a stationary sun and terrestrial motion, with all their accompanying assumptions, he was released only when he made a recantation of his opinions, and promised, under severe penalties, never again to propagate such infidel doctrines. But now that this infallible church has changed its doctrine in respect to science, there may be some who would like to send us to the Inquisition for venturing to express disbelief in the now accepted theories. Sir Isaac Newton is famous for the discovery of the law of universal gravitation, the existence of which neither he nor any of his disciples has ever proved. He merely suggested it. You have now had a brief history of the solar system, which first represents the sun as occupying a central position in the universe, with the earth and stars revolving around it, and then the whole universe shooting away through space, towards somewhere. It is the essence of the modern astronomical theories adopted and taught by the late Mr. Proctor, Sir Robert Ball, and most, if not all, present-day astronomers. It is like a scientifically spiced resurrection pie of the theories of Copernicus, Galileo, Newton, and Herschel, all minced together, and it is upon this pie we are invited to feed, and if it were possible, satisfy our mental hunger for more knowledge and a better understanding of terrestrial and celestial phenomena. Yet it is a system acknowledged to contain, quote, much error, unsound reasoning, and happy conjecture. It is further admitted to be, quote, nothing but a hypothesis. And then it is, as we have seen, a hypothesis about which the inventors or patentees do not agree amongst themselves. How can we mentally swallow, much less digest, such a conglomeration of unnatural, unproved, and contradictory theories? Assumptions not only highly improbable, but hostile to the evidence of our God-given senses. If we seek true knowledge, which word I find the dictionary renders information, instruction, practical acquaintance, on this subject, we shall have to digest something different from this astronomical pie, lest we too become tainted with its poison, and show the same symptoms of error, unsound reasoning, and happy conjecture and of mental aberration as exhibited by one of the promulgators of this modern system of cosmogony. The great underlying assumption of this science is that the earth is a globe. Unless the earth be globular, it could not be guilty of committing the offense of whirling us all through space around the sun at the terrible rate attributed to it, though as yet no evidence has been advanced convicting it of this folly. But just imagine, if you have the bump of imagination, a great sea-earth globe, more sea than land, whizzing away one thousand times faster than an express train, and by some imaginary stick-fast called gravitation, we are lashed to this ball like a man tied to a great flywheel. The idea is preposterous, unnatural, and wicked. I intend to prove the fallacy of this assumption, and to show the wickedness of cramming children at school with so impracticable a theory without its being questioned. The primary assumption of globularity we will deal with first, as the further assumptions of motion, gravitation, etc., must necessarily fall if we destroy their foundation.
Now, if we want to ascertain the shape of the floor of any large room, we get down to the floor itself, and do not go about measuring the gas globes or spots on the ceiling. So it is with respect to the earth. To determine its shape, we take observations of its surface, for whatever be the shape of the heavenly bodies, made only for lights, they cannot in any way affect the surface shape of the earth. The following are a few observations. If the sea earth be a globe, or the oblate spheroid of scientific belief, the curvature of its surface would be seen from suitable elevations in long distances with the naked eye, and it could not fail to be detected in short distances by the aid of a telescope. If, therefore, the surface of water is experimentally found to be level, and as it would be impossible to have level water on or around a sphere, the whole fabric of the globular theory must crumble to dust. Water, everywhere level, destroys all assumptions respecting rotundity, axial or orbital motions, and even the assumption of gravitation itself. In order, therefore, to demonstrate whether or not the surface of the water is level, the following experiments were made by a medical gentleman, Dr. Robotham, who adopted the nom de plume of parallax. In the county of Cambridge, there is an artificial river or canal called the Old Bedford. It is upwards of 20 miles in length, and passes in a straight line through that part of the fens called the Bedford Level. The water is nearly stationary, often completely so, and throughout its entire length it has no interruption from locks or water gates of any kind. The water is nearly stationary, often completely so, and throughout its entire length it has no interruption from locks or water gates of any kind, so that it is, in every respect, well adapted for ascertaining whether any or what amount of convexity really exists. Samuel Robotham wrote, A boat with a flagstaff, the top of the flag five feet above the surface of the water, was directed to sail from a place called Welch's Dam, a well-known ferry passage, to another called Wellney Bridge. These two points are six statute miles apart. The author, with a good telescope, went into the water, and with the eye about eight inches above the surface, observed the receding boat during the whole period required to sail to Wellney Bridge. The flag and the boat were distinctly visible throughout the whole distance. There could be no mistake as to the distance passed over, as the man in charge of the boat had instructions to lift one of his oars to the top of the arch of the moment he reached the bridge. The experiment commenced about three o'clock in the afternoon of a summer's day, and the sun was shining brightly and nearly behind or against the boat during the whole of its passage. Every necessary condition had been fulfilled, and the result was to the last degree definite and satisfactory. The conclusion was unavoidable, that the surface of the water for a length of six miles did not, to any appreciable extent, decline or curvate downwards from the line of sight. But if the earth is a globe, the surface of the six miles length of water would have been six feet higher in the center than at the two extremities. From this experiment it follows that the surface of standing water is not convex, and therefore that the earth is not a globe. On the contrary, this simple experiment is all sufficient to prove that the surface of the water is parallel to the line of sight, and is therefore horizontal, and that the earth cannot be other than a plane. Under exceptional conditions of the atmosphere, not only lights, but vessels themselves have been seen at great distances by the naked eye and further by the aid of telescope, distances incompatible with the theory of rotundity. I will give one, which is a striking example of this phenomenon. In Chambers' Journal of February 1895, page 32, the following appeared. A good many years ago, a pilot in the Meritus reported that he had seen a vessel which turned out to be 200 miles off. This incident caused a good deal of discussion in nautical circles at the time, and, strange to say, a seemingly well-authenticated case of the same kind occurred afterwards at Aden. A pilot there announced he had seen from the heights the Bombay steamer then nearly due. He stated precisely the direction in which he saw her, and added that her head was not then turned towards the port. Two days afterwards the missing steamer entered the port, and it was found on enquiries that at the time mentioned by the pilot she was exactly in the direction and position indicated by him but about 200 miles away. Such evidence is altogether irreconcilable with the theory of globularity. Theories may be false, but facts we cannot refute. This and the previous evidence with which we have dealt 
leads us to the unavoidable conclusion that the system of modern astronomy is false in its foundation, and therefore its conclusions are inconsistent and contradictory. On a spherical Earth, the vessel mentioned in the above quotation would have been 15,000 feet, or nearly three miles below the horizon of the observer, even after allowing as much as 1,660 feet above the sea level for the place of observation. It perplexes me to know how astronomers and those who accept their teachings can ignore such facts as these, for they surely must know about them, facts so diametrically opposed to the theories they propagate. Is it honest to ignore them? The idea of a globe whirling in space has been so drilled into us at school that we hardly like to give up the notion. But as thinking men, able to reason for ourselves, we cannot consistently continue to hold a theory foisted upon us during childhood, which we are now compelled to acknowledge is opposed to reason and contrary to fact. We might well repeat the question already asked by a scientific gentleman. Why should the education given in our schools and universities include a forced recognition of a theory which, when practically applied, must be ignored and contradicted? Can anyone tell us why? It will be interesting to hear what is the view of such regarding the shape of the world. To describe this, I cannot do better than refer you to Mr. Elliot, an American aeronaut, who, in a letter giving an account of his ascension from Baltimore, USA, thus speaks of the appearance of the Earth from an elevated balloon. Quote, I don't know that I ever hinted heretofore that the aeronaut may well be the most skeptical man about the rotundity of the earth. Philosophy imposes the truth upon us, but the view of the earth from the elevation of a balloon is that of an immense terrestrial basin, the deeper part of which is that directly under one's feet. As we ascend, the earth beneath us seems to recede, actually to sink away, while the horizon gradually and gracefully lifts a diversified slope stretching away farther and farther to a line that, at the highest elevation, seems to close with the sky. Thus, upon a clear day, the aeronaut feels as if suspended at about an equal distance between the vast blue oceanic concave above and an equally expanded terrestrial basin below. Another gentleman, Mr. Glacier, of the Royal Observatory, says, the horizon always appears on a level with the car. The following diagram illustrates the phenomena observed by these and other aeronauts. The horizon, AB, is always on a level with the eye at any altitude, and the earth, ACB, seems like a great basin beneath the balloon. This is what should be observed in accordance with the laws of perspective at an elevation above a plane surface. But if the earth were a globe, the horizon would gradually fall away from the observer and would naturally dip downwards more and more as he ascended, so that the supposed curvature of the Earth's surface should be distinctly visible at great altitudes, if it existed. As no dip of the horizon is seen, and no curvature observed anywhere, we are bound to conclude that the Earth is not a globe, but that, as already proved by observations and experiments, it is a vast extended plane. A ship's disappearance at sea is generally brought forward to prop up the unsound argument of the globular theory whenever this theory is challenged. But truth, which is antagonistic to all false theories, does not permit this prop to stand long. As the appearance or the disappearance of a ship at sea involves the operation of perspective, this question is worthy of our careful consideration. By studying the laws of perspective, we are enabled to give a correct and logical explanation of phenomena. It further enables us to expose the fallacy of the popular assumption that as the hull of a vessel disappears before the masts, the hull must have gone over and disappeared down at the other side of a hill of water. Apart from the evidence we have already adduced against the globular theory, this assumption is of no value, so far as it is intended to support the theory of rotundity, unless it can be shown that the disappearance of a ship at sea cannot be accounted for in any other way. But a proper application of the laws which govern our vision can and does logically explain this phenomenon, so that this astronomical prop must be dropped. Writing upon this subject in Science Siftings, the late Professor Huxley said, We assume the convexity of water, because we have no other way to explain the appearance and disappearance of ships at sea. I wonder whether Professor Huxley had ever heard of perspective. I know some of his readers have. He presumed very much upon their ignorance of it when he wrote he thought they would all accept his assumption. To assume the sphericity of the earth, because we cannot hear a man speaking five miles away, would be as consistent as making the same assumption because, at times, we are unable to see for more than twenty miles. But, you reply, our sense of hearing is limited. Is not our sense of vision also limited? 
Of course it is, and the laws of perspective clearly explain this limitation. Let us proceed to examine these laws. Perspective requires that all lines equidistant above or below the line of sight shall vanish in the line of sight at the same point. But lines more distant from the eye line, being longer in converging, must be carried further over the eye line before they meet it at an angle of one minute of a degree, which constitutes the vanishing point. No object below the eye line, while continuing at the same altitude, ever rises above it as it recedes, and no object above the eye line ever descends below it as it recedes, simply because when such object reaches the line of sight, the angle it forms with the eye is the minimum angle, or one minute of degree, within which objects are still visible, and beyond which, or less than which, they prospectively vanish. Since we have proved the Earth is a stationary plane, we are able without inconvenience to dispense with Sir Isaac Newton's laws of gravitation. If there were proof or truth in the theory of rotundity, we might welcome such a law as gravitation, for we have not, like flies, been provided with secretions in our feet to enable us to stick on to a whirling ball. How necessary some such a force would be if we hang head downwards or stick out as radii at various hours of the day and night, for these must be our positions at different times during the twenty-four hours if the earth has any axial motion, but somehow or other we are always on the top, so that our friends down in the antipodes are the people who mostly need gravitation. They cannot be on the top too, else it would be a queer-shaped globe. This universal law, according to Sir Robert Ball, affirms that every body in the universe attracts every other body with a force which varies inversely as the square of the distance. If this be so, I should like to know what is the nature of the pulling tackle? Is it solid, liquid, or gaseous? Is no one able to explain this mystery? It would be interesting to learn something definite about it, but when we are told of a something which we are unable to feel, see, taste, or smell, and which does not show any results for its universal pulling operations, what else can we reasonably call it but nothing? At a recent debate in Leicester upon this subject, the gentleman who represented the astronomer's position confessed that no one can tell what gravitation is, no, not even an angel from heaven. The question naturally arises, did they get the theory from some angel in the other place? Sir Isaac never made it clear what this law is, but I find that he himself confessed it was a, quote, great absurdity. In a letter to Dr. Bentley, February 25th, 1692, Newton says that gravitation should be innate and inherent in matter, so that one body can act upon another at a distance, is to me so great an absurdity that I believe no man who has in philosophical matters a competent faculty of thinking can ever fall into it. Yet many have fallen into this great absurdity. Such men, therefore, according to Newton, have not a competent faculty of thinking in philosophical matters. I am happy to be in agreement with Sir Isaac on this important point. Sir Robert Ball says, The law of gravitation underlies the whole of astronomy. It does not speak very well for the astronomy if it is founded on an acknowledged great absurdity. Perhaps some reader may kindly inform me how the planet Jupiter can pull our Earth without any chain or rope between, or how a fly in my room could manage to attract a stone on the beach at Douglas, Isle of Man, and this too, without any pulling tackle. It would be rather hard upon the poor fly. The idea of universal attraction is foolish in the extreme. It is an absurd theory foisted upon the credulous crowd. C. Vernon Boys, in his paper The Newtonian Constant of Gravitation, says, it is a mysterious power, which no man can explain of its propagation through space. All men are ignorant. Is not this an honest and authoritative confession of astronomical ignorance of their fundamental position? Professor W. B. Carpenter, in his paper Nature and Law, says, We have no proof, and in the nature of things can never get one, of the assumption of the attractive force exerted by the Earth, or by any of the bodies of the solar system, upon other bodies at a distance. The doctrine of universal gravitation, then, is a pure assumption. This absurd law, or mysterious power which no man can explain, the existence of which has never been proved, and of which its supposed operation through space all men are ignorant, amounts therefore to nothing but an empty assumption. Bodies by their own weight will either fall or rise until they have found their equilibrium. Consequently, Newton's apple fell to the ground simply because it was heavier than the atmosphere. 
successful attraction operates in the case of sweethearts separated by long distances, though I am not sure whether it is inversely proportional to the square of their distance. How cleverly Sir Isaac Guest discovered, I should state, from an apple falling to the ground by its own proper weight, that atoms million miles apart and stars down to a straw can pull each other without ropes by merely natural law. The famous German philosopher and poet Goethe, regarding the Newtonian system, said, It may be boldly asked, where can the man be found, possessing the extraordinary gifts of Newton, who could suffer himself to be deluded by such a hocus-pocus, if he had not in the first instance willfully deceived himself? To support his unnatural theory, Newton heaps fiction upon fiction, seeking to dazzle where he cannot convince. The time and space at my disposal will not permit me to go much further into the many side issues of this important subject. My desire, rather, is to establish the fundamental principles of zetetic science. The foundation of any science, or system of knowledge, is the most important part of the science, for it is indispensable. It is therefore of the greatest importance that it be sound and established on facts, not theories. It is recorded that Sir James Mackintosh said, Men fall into a thousand errors by reasoning from false premises. To fifty they make by wrong inferences from premises they employ. This statement is verified by the present condition of the astronomical science. It has unfortunately fallen into a thousand errors because its premises, the basis of its arguments, are hypothetical instead of being founded upon acknowledged facts. It is in this deplorable condition we now find it. I sometimes wonder whether astronomers themselves have faith in their unreasonable theories. No doubt some of them have, but after so many years of research, it is surprising they have not yet experimentally established the truth of their system. By what method could the true shape of the earth be found better than by practical experiments? Parallax, the founder of the Zetetic Society, some of whose experiments I have quoted, adopted this method, and his conclusions yet remain to be refuted. But since astronomers in general ignore this method of investigation, we are tempted to ask, are they afraid of the results of such observations? If I wanted to ascertain the dimensions of the floor of a hall, could I obtain these by taking observations of some objects on the ceiling? Such observations might acquaint me with the architecture and colorings of the ceiling, but they would not instruct me as to the size or shape of the floor. Since the theories of astronomical science are based upon the question of the surface shape of the Earth, which represents the floor of the universe, it is this subject one would rightly expect astronomers to take much trouble to decide. Instead of this, we find them continually making observations of the celestial bodies, informing us of their eccentricities, or of the laws which govern them. These observations are interesting and instructive, but they are not of primary importance. As I have already mentioned, the laws which govern the behavior of light and celestial phenomena cannot in any way affect or determine the shape of the earth. No two subjects could be more dissimilar than ethereal light and the dark solid earth. No two facts in nature contradict each other, though our explanations of them may be contradictory. We have established one important fact, that the earth is a stationary plane and to this we shall adhere until the evidence adduced in support of it has been logically refuted. The second in importance, though perhaps a more subtle question, is the explanations of the laws which govern the heavenly bodies and the motions of these lights. All true zetetics will seek this explanation in harmony with the plain truth already established, but should we some day find that the moon or Mars is not behaving exactly in the way we believed, no zetetic would be so illogical as to suppose that, because of this, the earth cannot be a plane. Such a line of argument would be unreasonable. If Mars is shown to act perversely from any standpoint, the logical deduction would be to alter our standpoint and inquire further into the peculiarities of his peregrinations. But before we give up our belief in the plain earth truth, someone must come forward and prove that water is convex and not level.
so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video presentation. If you did, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, like the video, and share it on your favorite social media sites. There's a lot more to come, so stay tuned, and we'll see you back next time.